All right, so good morning, everyone. I am Brian Jory from the New York State Environmental Facilities Corporation. It's great to be here this morning. And for those of you that don't know who we are, uh, EFC is a public benefit corporation. Uh, we provide financial and technical assistance primarily to municipalities to provide low cost financing for their water quality infrastructure projects. And I say primarily uh, the programs that we're talking about today, specifically the Green Innovation Grant Program is applicable to anyone. So anyone can apply to that program. They don't have to be municipalities. They can be nonprofits and um, private entities. So we'll get into that in a little bit of detail, but primarily we do work with municipalities across New York State. Uh, we administer a number of different programs involving the state revolving fund, uh, which is the largest in the nation, New York State's uh, revolving fund. And through this, we have provided over $34 billion in low cost financing and grants for approximately 3,000 water and sewer infrastructure projects across New York State. Um, in addition to the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, I also help to manage the Ready, the resiliency project along Lake Ontario, as well as we have a lot of other programs, including the engineering planning grant and a bunch of other uh, discretionary programs that we fund across New York State. So today we're gonna be talking about green infrastructure and um, what is green infrastructure? So we, our funding comes from the EPA. Um, so we use the EPA definition of green infrastructure um, and so in this situation, we're talking about green stormwater infrastructure. We're not talking about um, energy efficiency or uh, let's say other types of uh, green infrastructure. We're talking like uh, lighting, uh, low LED lighting or something like that. We're talking about stormwater. Um, and there's a variety of different scales that that can be you know, looked at. Uh, but really what we're looking to do here is manage wet weather um, and maintain and restore the natural hydrology. Um, this can be done by infiltrating, evapotranspirating, and harvesting stormwater. Um, on a regional scale, this can be done looking at large uh, restoration of floodplains um, and imperviousness in the watershed. And then on the smaller, you know, local individual project scale, this can be things like bioretention systems, stormwater street trees, permeable pavements, or individual harvest and reuse systems. So, the eight different practices that we consider green stormwater infrastructure. Um, this is a listing of them right here. Um, I highlighted a few of them in bold here, uh, bioretention, porous pavement, stormwater harvesting, as well as stormwater street trees. Um, and I highlighted those because those are some of the specific practices um, that we're going to be looking at as part of the case study uh, in a little bit after um, my presentation here um, with what the um, city has been looking at. Uh, but some of the other things that we can also fund are construction and restoration of floodplains, riparian buffers, streams, and or wetlands. Uh, an example of that is this picture on the right. This is in Lake Placid, um, where actually, funny, Emily mentioned dam removal. Um, there was a dam that was removed, and, and the natural stream hydrology was then restored to this area uh, of the Chubb River up in Lake Placid. And then there were also some uh, wetlands that were created as well as all of this fish habitat and um, buffer uh, planting that was done along the stream channel. Uh, also looking at downspout disconnection, green roofs and green walls, uh, as well as stream daylighting. So I have a few other samples of some pictures here of some, you know, what some of those things would look like. Um, this is SUNY Oneonta, um, and this is a kind of an innovative bioretention system uh, that was done on a hillside, so a little bit different than a normal, let's say, flat site, uh, but this was done with uh, the combination of kind of cutting into the grade as well as some retaining walls, as you can see, um, and this was a whole treatment train of bioretention that was coming down this slope, uh, as well as the pathway that runs uh, just to the left of the image uh, was a porous pavement pathway, a porous asphalt pathway that they installed. Uh, another look at some um, floodplain restoration uh, and floodplain bench work that we have done. Uh, this is in the town of Whitestown in Oneida County. Um, and this was a project that has repeated flooding that was um, looked at to basically create a floodplain bench, um, which if you're not familiar with that term, that's really trying to uh, create a safe spot for the water to go as opposed to having it flood 
downstream, um, we let's say have it uh, flood safe in a safe area. Uh, in this situation, it was a park area um, that had a lot of uh, capacity. So a lot of soil was removed and a, a floodplain was created in an area that there wasn't any room for one previously. Uh, this is a little bit of a combination image of a few different practices, but this is the Rochester Museum of Science. Um, and you can see sort of a demonstration green roof at the top on the left as well as some stormwater harvesting. So the area on the right of this structure um, is sloped inward, um, and then the stormwater is harvested down the center of that uh, trough there, then down and underneath the walkway where the, uh, the gentleman in the purple shirt is standing, um, and then it's actually going into a bioretention area. So it's not that any of these practices um, have to stand alone on their own. They certainly can. In this situation, um, there was this whole treatment process of multiple different practices that were combined. Uh, green Roof, uh, this is the city of Jamestown out in the western part of the state. Um, and this is a, a large urban green roof in the middle of the city. Um, green roofs can be planted with a variety of different uh, roof plantings. Um, this was a sedum mat that you can see here on the left as well as some shrubs and then turf grass in the center. Uh, there also can be larger, uh, deeper soil profiles that have uh, even larger plants, even up to trees uh, that can be planted. Um, and then another picture of, I believe, Rochester Museum of Science with some porous concrete sidewalks as well as flexi pave. Uh, again, another type of porous pavement that can be used. Um, and this was done as part of this sort of streetscape setting um, with planting uh, trees and the flexi pave allows for additional and the porous pavement allow for additional um, water infiltration directly into the sub base, which allows for the trees to th thrive and flourish, as well as reducing uh, impacts to the surrounding combined sewer area. Uh, and then this picture here is a stormwater harvest and reuse system. Um, so this is actually out in Buffalo. Um, and you can see all the white piping is the flow coming off of this large roof structure, which actually is a roof over the top of um, a ice skating rink, uh, kind of an outside exterior ice skating rink. And um, the flow coming down the large pipe then gets siphoned off into this tank. That tank water is then used for either irrigation on site or as well as being put into the ice machines um, to re-nourish the ice on the um, ice skating rink. And this photo here is a picture of uh, res wetland restoration. Um, so this area was historically somewhat low in the town of Orangetown. And this is a large um, wetland that was created that's taking the flow from the surrounding, I think it's between 30 and 45 acres of this surrounding area. Um, and it's basically treating the flow prior to it hitting uh, the Fall Hill Creek in this area. And uh, the city of Yonkers uh, stream daylighting project. Um, this is the Sawmill River that many people are aware of if you're um, ever traveling on Amtrak and looking out to your right as you're traveling north or to your left as you're going south, um, you'll see this project. Um, and this is phase one um, of the Sawmill River uh, daylighting. This used to be a large parking lot and urban plaza area um, that was not really being utilized for the public uh, benefit. This project came in and basically as part of a combination of our funding, Empire State Development and lots of other uh, funding that the city was able to leverage, they were able to restore uh, the natural stream channel, as you can see here. Um, there's a tremendous amount of benefits to both providing oxygen and air and light to uh, the creek at this point. Um, and it was so successful that phase one was a, a tremendous success and they moved on to phase two, three, and they just recently were awarded um, phase four funding to complete uh, another section of the project. All right, so some program updates. Um, these are updates from the 2022 program. Traditionally, the program is offered on a yearly basis. Um, and we now have three different categories. So I, today we're really focusing on stormwater. 
Uh, but I do just want to mention um, that about two years ago, the program eligibility opened up to energy efficiency projects that specifically for uh, wastewater treatment plants and to offset the energy used at wastewater treatment plants, as well as water efficiency. Um, this is most utilized in water meter replacements or installing water meters. Um, both of those entities do have to be municipal projects, unlike the stormwater projects, as I mentioned, that anyone can apply for. Um, just to note as well, the program's been around since 2009. Um, we've awarded uh, almost $240 million of projects um, to 280 projects all across the state. And as I mentioned, these are soil and water conservation districts, these are municipalities, these are private entities, these are libraries, um, any, any sort of entity um, we have pretty much funded uh, across those 280 projects. Um, and again, this is a sort of update for the 2022 program. We don't have any um, announcement of what the, the next round of the 2023 program, but these are just some general ideas of, of what was eligible in uh, 2022 and what the, the program rules were. So for stormwater, um, projects are eligible for up to a maximum of 90% of total eligible costs. They are required to provide a, a minimum of 10% local match. And we really have focused the last couple of years on communities with lower incomes, as well as environmental justice communities. Uh, so again, a little bit more into our priorities. Um, one of the first priorities that we're really looking at is climate change mitigation. So any sort of reduction of greenhouse gases and or expansion of clean energy initiatives. So that priority is a little bit more geared towards the energy efficiency projects, but there you know, could be some benefits um, from the stormwater projects as well. As I mentioned, environmental justice, um, this is the DEC definition, um, the advancement of the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, income, national origin, or, or color, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies, and in this case, uh, funding for different projects. Um, Another program priority is integration. Um, this is for the re-envisioning re of water infrastructure uh, for long-term resiliency, reliability of water resources, as well as really looking at these community benefits, um, both economic, climate action, and water equity, and looking at integrating green stormwater into traditionally gray infrastructure projects. And our last two priorities here would be natural restoration. Um, this would be projects that demonstrate the effectiveness of green infrastructure through the natural environment, such as floodplains, as I mentioned before, in Whitestown, or riparian buffers, streams, and or wetlands, as I mentioned, uh, in Orangetown that we've worked on. Um, and then our last program priority is these larger transformational projects. Um, these are projects that utilize green practices to provide multiple benefits. Um, not just environmental, but economic and social. So this, for example, would be something like the project in Yonkers that not just gives a water quality benefit, but has all of these other benefits creating your community um, or your uh, project location. And these projects would also be aligned with the larger goals of the community and or the region. Um, in terms of you know, dollars available this last round, we had $15 million that was available uh, in 2022, the applications are typically, um, they basically the announcement happens that we have funding in this last round, it happened in May, they were then due in July, um, and awards just happened um, this past Friday in uh, November. Sometimes they also can happen in December. Traditionally, they happen in December. I mentioned environmental justice. Um, I mentioned um, the, the definition here. What we're really looking at here is how your project is impacting an environmental justice area. So in theory, you know, in this map on the right, which I know is a little bit small, but this is showing sort of the confluence of the Mohawk and the Hudson here, Albany, and looking at Schenectady. Um, so for example, in the city of Albany, you can see on this map, um, the areas in purple, are areas um, that are identified as potential environmental justice areas. Um, this is the mapping tool that we use. Um, this is on the DEC website, specifically in the DEC info locator. Um, and so in your project um, feasibility study or engineering report, you would um, include a map of your project location 
showing um, if there is any um, in your area and how you're impacting those. Um, and then the median household income. So I mentioned a few slides ago, um, looking at really what is the median household income. Um, and we're really trying to promote uh, providing our dollars to communities that are in areas that are at or below the threshold. Um, so for example, the median household income for uh, the, the regions of Long Island, New York City, and Mid-Hudson is 95,000, and the median household income for the remainder of the state is 75,000. Uh, again, this was the, the thresholds that we used uh, in 2022. These thresholds could change, uh, but these were the thresholds that we used this year. Um, and there is a listing of um, income by municipality on our website. If you have any questions, certainly let us know. Happy to uh, look that up with you. Um, and getting into funding. So basically the way that we look at it is um, you would be eligible for up to that 90% uh, funding if you met the threshold of the MHI. So for example, if you were in the city of Albany and your uh, median household income was 50,000, then you would be eligible for up to the 90%. But if you were in the city of Catskill um, or let's say Kingston and you were above the threshold, then you would not uh, be eligible for that 90%. You'd be eligible for up to 75% grant. The remainder would be a local match. Uh, and again, if you have questions about specific uh, projects, we can certainly um, discuss that with you. And um, eligible applicants historically um, have been anyone. So this can be municipalities, private entities, state agencies, uh, soil and water conservation districts, um, non-for-profits, uh, anyone is eligible for the program. In terms of the application, uh, the application has historically gone through the consolidated funding application um, and applicants in addition to submitting the application must submit a conceptual site plan, uh, existing conditions plan, site photographs, as well as a feasibility study. Uh, there's information on our website, including an outline for what we're looking for in that feasibility study. But really the, the key thing we're looking for is, is your project feasible? Um, what are the existing conditions on your site specifically? Let's say for, if you're doing a porous parking lot, um, what are the ground conditions? Do you have clay soils and bedrock at a foot down, or do you have sandy soils and um, really good percolation? And then uh, just a few additional uh, items to note, if successfully, um, if you're successful in applying and aw being awarded, um, there are requirements that here um, that are required as part of our uh, entering into a grant agreement and actually moving forward with your project, including environmental review, um, understanding sort of the full budget of the project and showing us that you have significant sources of local match, uh, demonstrating that you have the legal right to own, operate, and maintain the project, as well as MWBE. Um, single audit compliance as defined um, in that section listed on the first bullet, as well as um, for treatment works projects, which would be specifically those energy and water efficiency projects, um, compliance with Davis Bacon and American Iron and Steel. Uh, another requirement, just to note, this is a somewhat new requirement. Um, we do require if you're looking for our funds to be used for the architectural engineering or soft costs, um, they, they do need to be procured in line with the federal procurement policy. Um, that policy is listed here in these um, five bullet points. And um, there's a, a certification that you would need to sign, basically certifying as the entity that you did procure in that policy. And as I mentioned before, um, the application deadline is typically the end of July. Uh, typically the program opens up at some point in the spring. I say typical because um, from the time that I worked on the, the program from 2014 to uh, 2019, that was a pretty standard cycle. Obviously 2020 changed things and we had a, a cycle that was uh, way off of that typical window. Um, so uh, if you do wanna be subscribed to our eBlast system that gives you updates to when things are available, certainly let me know. I'm happy to add you to our subscription as well as continuously, you know, checking our website as well. But uh, sometimes it's easier to, to be subscribed to an e-blast. So with that, I will 
stop my screen share and we can move on to the case study here. Got a couple of good questions in the chat, but we're going to hold questions until the end uh, in case there's more that come or some that are answered in the case study. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Joe Bryant from the city of Poughkeepsie. Um, our planned presenter couldn't be here. He was called for ju jury duty, uh, but we really want to thank Joe for, for jumping up and giving this talk. Joe is the budget director for the finance department of the city of Poughkeepsie. Thanks so much, Joe. Yeah, thank you, Emily, and the uh, Hudson River Watershed Alliance for having us here, and uh, Brian for, uh, you know, putting us forward as a uh, good candidate for the case study. So let me share the screen. Okay, can you see everything okay? Great. So as um, Emily mentioned, I come from the uh, finance side of things. So if you know, if you have any specific uh, questions regarding some of the engineering stuff that we go over, please uh, I can put out my contact information after that, and feel free to send it along, and I can you know disseminate it to the uh, city engineer if there's any questions that I can't answer. So a bit of background: if you guys don't know, uh, the city of Poughkeepsie is in Dutchess County, right on the Hudson River. We have a population of just over thirty thousand people, and a total annual budget across all funds of around a hundred million dollars. So uh, Brian kind of went into this, but with the uh, regarding the grant process, I'll just highlight some of the uh, some of the steps along the way. So the city of Poughkeepsie has uh, two separate GIGP grants. Both of them are uh, green stormwater infrastructure that is at Malcolm X Park, which is mainly focused on uh, a protected waterway, the Falco Creek, and uh, Liberty Street parking lot, which is mainly focused on flood mitigation. So in the GIGP grant application, you uh, submit the online application from the EFC website and the engineering study feasibility report. This approximately a three month, two to three month uh, kind of application timeline. So if you're considering applying, one thing that um, I would recommend is getting out ahead on this because, uh, you know, with us, it turned out that one of the projects we had to pull together the, the engineering uh, study feasibility report and something like 30 days and it, uh, put a lot of stress on our already overworked uh, city engineer. So it's something that you want to really make sure just that you plan ahead and factor in enough time. Uh, post award, you have to submit the project budget, project schedule, um, compliance documentation, that's your MWBE, EEO, uh, Davis-Bacon, and I'll, I'll get into a bit more later, but uh, that's also something that you have to make sure you're you have a strong enough team in uh, the finance department or whoever is overseeing it. Here in the uh, city, we ran into a couple roadblocks regarding um, getting MWBE waivers from some of the uh, contractors or vendors that we used on different projects. So you really want to make sure that um, you have a solid procurement team that can you know, adequately uh, submit documentation so that you, we can receive the uh, money from the state. Uh, bid documents and construction contracts are reviewed prior to bidding, and then you enter the construction phase uh, and into project closeout. This involves the uh, site inspection by EFC, the GIGP certification of project completion, and a few other documents. And if at any point, uh, Brian, you want to uh, hop in, uh, Brian really was a great help to us on this project, and he's the reason that we were able to get it done. So launching into the first, I guess, uh, case that we have here at Malcolm X Park. So the project goal mainly was to uh, protect the uh, Falco Creek. It's a 303D listed impaired waterway. So we wanted to uh, use green infrastructure stormwater practices to reduce uh, polluted runoff from reaching the creek. And looking down at the uh, conceptual design, those are the practices that were eligible for certain infrastructure uh, funding. So bioretention. Uh, you know, removing contaminants from stormwater runoff, uh, permeable pavement to ensure that more uh, water can, you know, enter the ground and less water is actually running off into the uh, local waterways, and uh, the stormwater street trees. So with that, it uh, helps, you know, take in a lot of the water, helps filter it, and then also as the trees eventually get bigger, the canopy can help, uh, you know, slow the flow of water uh, to the ground. 
And educational outreach was another component of it. We want to uh, increase public awareness of green infrastructure practices at the site, because that is something that, you know, when you're going through the uh, legislative process and, you know, working with your legislative body, for us, it's the city's common council and the public, it's something that people might not be the most uh, aware of or necessarily have the greatest appetite to address. We're kind of a fiscally stressed city. And so a lot of the times in the past, it kind of seemed that the cities just were always, uh, you know, playing catch up, just putting band-aids on problems. And that's, this is something that with the help of uh, the GIGP funding, we were able to, you know, take a step forward and uh, protect this waterway. And it is helped kind of raise awareness to the issue of uh, stormwater runoff. And then park amenities. So what you guys can't see, uh, located right on the other side of the uh, Fall Hill Creek here. The creek runs north to south throughout the city. Right on the other side, there is a local elementary school. So this is a heavily trafficked park. Our goal, if we're going to be coming in and doing all the construction on this uh, property, we really wanted to also make improvements to the park in terms of the services that they receive. Now, that is something that is not GIGP eligible when you're talking about park amenities, uh, benches, new tables, new lighting, that sort of stuff. So I'll get into a bit later, but we are uh, very grateful for the uh, support we luckily were able to receive from uh, Scenic Hudson, who I believe is in the uh, in the audience right now. With uh, help from Scenic Hudson and money that uh, the city put forward itself, we were able to turn this um, stormwater project into kind of a total revamp of the uh, of the park and make a lot of improvements. So right along the creek. On this end, you can uh, see my mouse cursor. Running along the creek uh, is where a lot of our bioretention and uh, stormwater street trees are going to be planted. We have uh, a new entryway with seating. If you drive past, I in the past, it isn't necessarily the um, best looking park from the street. And so overall, I think this will really enhance the experience. And then we built uh, two new basketball courts there. So as you can see, that would uh, take up a lot of pavement for the walkways, the basketball courts. And so that's kind of where the uh, permeable or porous pavement component came into play. Uh, also, just speaking to the um, environmental justice component that Brian mentioned, this uh, park does fall within a uh, qualified census tract. So some of the uh, speed bumps are just uh, issues that we ran into during the project that I think other municipalities, other nonprofits, people going forward uh, would like to know because it's stuff that we've learned from is uh, number one, the location and public access to the park uh, complicate construction operations. If you go past the park now, we're in the middle of construction and there is uh, so much work being done there, uh, equipment, a lot of uh, you know, ground being torn up, but this is right in the middle of the city with public access. So you have to be aware of um, you know, uh, citizens coming through and not leaving equipment out at, uh, at night there. And with the uh, location, it's on a Mansion Street. It's kind of a uh, thin street. So just getting even trucks and equipment in and out is uh, just something that you have to plan for. Uh, as I said, the park amenities cannot be funded under the GIGP grant. So this is something that we coming in and during your application process, if you're going to have it be part of kind of a uh, larger process, and so in this case, it's mainly focused on the stormwater through GIGP, but while we're there doing the work, we also want to improve the uh, park in terms of user experience and stuff. You really want to uh, make sure that you have secured the additional funding to be able to move forward with that. So thanks again to uh, Scenic Hudson, who is very helpful there. We owe a lot. And then uh, coordination with vendors for paperwork submission. I spoke about this before uh, in terms of the quarterly MWBE filings, MWBE waivers, both on the uh, city's end here in procurement, as well as in yeah, working with your vendors, with your contractors to make sure that everything is being filed in a timely manner. That's similar to you know, most uh, projects that require state funding, but just in this case, it's something that kind of held us up a bit afterwards. So uh, the project was managed by the city engineer. We uh, first went out with the construction bid in July of this year and uh, selected the lowest bidder, Contact Construction, and they're doing work right now. Again, uh, you can go in and uh, if you, anyone comes down to the city of Poughkeepsie, I encourage you to drive past and you'll be able to see all the work that's getting done. 
So we're consistent with our budget and timeline. And right now construction is estimated to be completed next spring. So right in time for uh, you know, the park to be open and people to be using it. Our second case is the uh, Liberty Street parking lot. So this is mainly focused on uh, stormwater infrastructure in terms of flooding. So right by that park here, or sorry, not park, right by the parking lot is a real business redevelopment zone. We have a lot of new restaurants, uh, residences, a lot of kind of up and coming places nearby, and they experience severe flooding issues in the basements, as well as putting real stress on our uh, CSOs. With this new parking lot, we installed all uh, permeable pavement, as well as stormwater street trees. So you can see the whole lot really is permeable pavement. And then running along the middle is the uh, tree planting, which also should help, you know, the trees will be healthy because with the permeable pavement and it'll also take, continue to uh, take less stress in terms of flooding. So through this process, we were able to uh, secure approximately like a, a hundred year floodplain for the businesses there. Previously, their uh, basements would flood frequently. And when you're talking about restaurants and stuff there, where a lot of food and stuff is stored in the basement, there's also a yoga studio there. It's that can create a real problem for uh, people who are operating the businesses there. And so with the hundred year floodplain, you know, that is not perfect. We still will feel storms like that, particularly with uh, climate change. We have seen more and more of these, you know, record-breaking uh, storms and flooding events, uh, particularly last year. I just think of when uh, Hurricane Ida came through. It put a ton of stress on our uh, CSOs and on our pump stations, and it actually led to uh, some critical damage at one of our pump stations. So through all this process, if we can uh, move forward to addressing climate climate change by you know increasing the uh, floodplain, making it so that we need higher magnitude storms to address it, that is kind of building out for the future. So we combined it with efforts to expand the parking lot capacity. You can see here along the uh, left-hand side there. So there's two separate entrances to the parking and exits from the parking lot now uh, to expand lot capacity and install uh, modern parking meters. So just really revamping the uh, the area there, it will also uh, then, you know, bring in more revenue to the city uh, through more people parking there and it allows more people to uh, go out and be customers at the local businesses. Uh, visitor safety. Overall, it's known you don't want to have a uh, flooded or icy uh, parking lot that creates a lot of dangers for people driving, people walking through and just people visiting it, they might not come. So it uh, helps create a safe environment for residents and visitors who are utilizing the parking lot. So uh, Liberty Street uh, parking lot was not managed by the uh, city engineer. We uh, hired an outside engineering consultant to manage the uh, project as it's underway. And uh, both have, uh, you know, pros and cons. In this case, we needed the, uh, you know, with the level of specificity with the project, it's something that was better outsourced to a consultant that was already working kind of on our uh, water and sewer portfolio. So some speed bumps that we ran into along the way was an inability to combine the project to address the uh, separation of combined sewer overflow piping. But so, you know, we weren't able to increase the scope of it uh, in that way. But one good thing of this is that it, Kind of what I mentioned before regarding the parks, it helps bring public attention to it. So um, the issue of our combined sewer overflows is something that now we have developed a roughly like 15 year uh, portfolio that we're trying to address. We're going to get uh, started underway with a Falk Hill Trunk Sewer Project next year uh, to address it. So just kind of getting started on Liberty Lot uh, helps raise public awareness to the stress that is on our CSOs and allows us to better capital plan. For, uh, for out years. Scheduling issues and scope creep, yeah. So this project uh, began right around, right before uh, kind of COVID hit, right during that time. And so as everyone's experienced, uh, the supply chain issues and uh, inflation that came along with that really ran up our, um, our cost beyond what our initial budget and uh, schedule was laid out to it, to delay the time and increase the price of stuff. So 
luckily, and this is um, not something that is necessarily common practice, but we were able to address part of the cost overrun with uh, some CWSRF funding. But the lesson kind of from this is to really factor in a sizable contingency so that you can be prepared if any issues come up. And, you know, especially that we all are feeling it after COVID and prices are rising and the supply chain still haven't recovered. So now more than ever, it's you really want to uh, make sure that you have enough contingency or an alternative uh, funding source to be able to support projects in case they, uh, you know, you experience scheduling issues or scope creep. And uh, coordination with vendors for the paperwork submission. You'll you see it. It's a running theme that uh, I've touched upon a few times now. But again, that has you know held us up in being able to uh, draw down money from the uh, CWSRF funding. And so then it holds up vendors from uh, getting paid on time. So as the municipality, um, as the recipient of the uh, GIGP funding, we want to make sure that both yourself, but as well as then the uh, vendors and contractors that you work with are meeting the deadlines for submission of paper. Uh, so the construction contract was awarded in spring of 2021. We, like I said, uh, experienced multiple cost overruns and schedule delays. I believe it was like eight increases. Eight small increases in, in price as we went, but the uh, construction work is uh, concluded this fall. Um, as you guys could see in the last picture, the parking lot is done. And so right now we're just kind of in that last step of uh, wrapping up the, uh, the project with its, um, you know, post-construction work. And uh, the city will hold an event celebrating the reopening of the improved Liberty Street parking lot in the next few weeks. Supposed to be last month, but then um, some scheduling stuff came up with the administration. And so we pushed it back. But again, if anyone's in the area and uh, hears about it, I encourage you guys to come by, check out some local business. And so uh, for the closing overall, just kind of wrapping up our, our total experience, uh, uh, I would say from this case study, you would want to take that if you're going to utilize uh, green stormwater infrastructure as part of a larger project portfolio, that can be good in that it helps uh, raise public awareness and potential investment over time. So like I mentioned with Liberty Street in terms of addressing the uh, CSC, CSOs and building out kind of a uh, portfolio or master plan uh, for the next 15 years, it can be a good first step in doing that, but you just really have to be aware of what can or cannot be funded through GIGP and identify additional sources of funding, both or you know strong contingencies, both in case you experience cost overrun or if there are you know components of the project that is not GIGP eligible. Uh, proper budgeting and project maintenance is crucial factor in the size of a contingency and just stay on top of the uh, reporting requirements. Have open communication with your vendors, contractors, with um, Brian or who, whoever is uh, your contact at the state, and then everything should go smoothly. We're very uh, thankful for the and uh, funding that we received. And, and proud of the work that's getting done. We're glad that the projects are now kind of reaching a point of uh, completion or, or getting there and construction's underway. And yeah, so uh, Emily, thank you for, for having me and I'd like to open the floor to any questions. So there's ribbon cutting for the parking lot. That's uh, the kind of event that I love to go to. So that's great. Um, congratulations on completing that project. And exci it's very exciting to hear about the work at Malcolm X Park that's underway as well. Um, so we've got a couple of questions. Um, and one, I see that uh, Brian has already answered in the chat, which is around the link to the list of income by municipality, looking at that medium household income. So uh, you should be able to see the link to that in the chat. I'll also be sending that out when we send out the recording of this um, for reference. And, and Emily, just the other question I get sometimes on that one is if you're a private entity or let's say a soil and water conservation district or nonprofit, you're not a municipality, so how would that work? And it's based on the location of your project. So if you're a non-for-profit in the city of Poughkeepsie, then you would use the city of Poughkeepsie's uh, median household income uh, in your application. So that's just a, a question I get quite frequently, so. Great, thank you so much. Um, open up chat. So do you anticipate, I think this is for Brian, do you anticipate the passage of the Bond Act will influence the funding available through the Green Innovation Grant Program? And if so, when? I would definitely say it would impact additional funding on its 
on the whole, I'm not sure which programs and when that will happen. Um, that is to be determined for sure, but I would definitely anticipate additional funding for green infrastructure and other types of, you know, resiliency and stormwater projects. I just don't have a definitive timeline or know when or how or which programs it will be impacted, but it's definitely a good thing. Great. So this is breaking news that the uh, Bond Act Prop 1 passed uh, as of Tuesday. So we'll, we'll wait to hear more updates on how that will impact the available funding and, and what that means for our communities. In the GIDP grant criteria, it sounds like you're looking specifically at the potential environmental justice areas mapped by DEC. Are you also considering the CLCPA disadvantaged community criteria that's been laid out? Yeah, that's a great question. At this point, we're just initially using the DEC mapping, you know, but if you had additional information about like, so let's say you weren't in one of the DEC, you know, areas, but you have some additional criteria and you think that, you know, you could be applicable for that, uh, I would say definitely submit it as part of your application as well as, you know, part of the report that is submitted that goes over all that criteria and it certainly could be evaluated. Great, thank you. Um, I have a question for Joe. Um, I think one of the, the components of the project in Poughkeepsie, particularly at Malcolm X Park, has been some of the community engagement to get a better sense of what um, community members are looking for in a park along the Fallkill Creek, particularly at that site right next to the elementary yeah. school. Could you speak a little bit to the community engagement process at Malcolm X Park in particular, but also if the Liberty Street parking lot had a similar or a different approach to community engagement? Um, yeah, so uh, I will have to uh, follow up to get the exact details on that. My apologies um, coming in uh, more from the finance side. But yeah, we did uh, hold a few different uh, community panels and events to try to get out what uh, sorts of like recreation equipment and stuff uh, people wanted there in terms of the, uh, the layout of the park and um, additions that we put in there. But uh, my apologies, I will follow up to get uh, more specific information. You on that. I might be able to answer a little bit more too in terms of some of the background I have on the historical nature of the projects. And I know that obviously for the parking lot project, I think the the, the things that were looked at were obviously very different. Um, and you know, talking to business owners and keeping the same number of parking spaces and keeping parking available was obviously really key for that project. Whereas, you know, the park project, as far as I know, I don't think there's any interior, you know, parking or road into it. It's all just walking and people parking out on that main road. Um, so in that situation, as Joe said, it's really a lot more of like what sort of amenities are people looking for? Obviously there were, you know, uh, court, uh, there was a court there that was in disrepair. And I'm sure that one of the things that, you know, the consultant and the, the city looked at is like, well, do we want to replace it? What, what do we want to replace it with? And talking to the community to try to figure out how that best, um, what that best would look like. And from our perspective, usually that's all done before you would even apply because you need to know what, you know, what the community and what the city or entity is looking for at that point. Great, thank you. And I, I see a note here in the chat that Cena Cutson did extensive public programming and outreach at Malcolm X Park, including educational programming along the Fall Kill. Um, so that's that's great. I think it speaks to the collaborative nature of different project partners playing different roles and the value of having the uh, municipality partner with nonprofits as well. I think there's a lot of really helpful aspects of this case study for us to think about in getting these large scale projects done. Um, and I'll, I'll also mention that here in the city of Kingston, I'm on a project advisory committee or was on a project advisory committee for a parking lot project and really helpful and interesting to hear the perspective of the business owners going through that process, what some of their needs are, where there needs to be loading and unloading spaces that you know they need to get access through the parking lot where you should not put a bioretention area. Um, and so I think that community engagement process is so valuable, especially for a park that's designed to have public amenities but also for a parking lot, which I think might be um, not, as, not as obvious. The other sort of unique piece of the parking lot project in the city of Poughkeepsie is um, they utilize these uh, porous concrete slabs 
for the sidewalk than um, that picture, the really cool picture that Joe showed, the drone photo, I assume it was a drone, you know, from above, you could kind of see the lighter color pavement. And that is all these large pieces of porous uh, concrete, which we've found, you know, we've done porous concrete all over the state. And we found really that precast porous concrete is the best way to go because all of the, um, you know, site conditions of when they actually pour it in the, you know, factory are all uh, very strict and um, the curing time and all that kind of stuff. And then you come out with a final product um, that's really meant to last. And that was what was utilized there. And it creates kind of a neat um, area to, to bisect the parking lot to allow for pedestrian access. And then it's raised a little bit, so it also allows for a safety component as well, as well as that water quality benefit. So again, that kind of goes back to the the items that I was mentioning in terms of we're, we're, it's not just about the stormwater, you know, safety components, uh, aesthetics, all that kind of stuff is is definitely things that can help on that triple you know benefit there. Great, thank you. Um, so I think this. This might be for Brian, but I'm curious to hear Joe's response to this too. Can you talk a bit about the balance between large scale versus smaller scale projects when choosing which projects to fund? Yeah, so that's a great question. So from our perspective, you know, we go through a lengthy scoring process. So from the time that the applications are due to the time that announcements happen, uh, we go through a, a really rigorous review. Um, two different reviewers review every single application then they're scored in a group setting um, where we have folks from the DEC Division of Water main office, as well as our technical folks, both Lansky Bartex, which is what I am, as well as uh, engineers, program folks, compliance folks really look at all these different applications. And one of the main components that we're looking for is not the only component, but one of the main components that we're looking for is the water quality benefit. So for example, if you have a project in, uh, let's say the city of Poughkeepsie or any city, you know, a large city in the, the state that has a combined sewer overflow um, concern versus a project that's in an area that doesn't have a combined sewer issue. So let's say in the town of Bethlehem where I live, you know, we don't have combined sewers, but the same parking lot project was to come before us, the same exact project with the same benefit, you know, the same size, same water quality in like a city with CSO versus a town without a CSO. Um, we're really looking at that water quality benefit. So uh, a city with a combined sewer and having that benefit is what we're really looking for. So that is a little bit of that insight into what we're looking for in that water quality. In terms of the, the size, um, obviously a project that's larger that has a larger you know, water quality benefit would score higher in certain components, but it's not necessarily that we would only fund large projects. There are smaller projects that we do fund. For example, this last round, um, we funded a project in um, the city of Hudson, uh, a kind of a small redevelopment project um, that utilized multiple forms of green infrastructure. Again, it's in a combined sewer area, but multiple forms of green infrastructure. Um, and so that it really is a case by case um, thing. And we're really looking at all of the different components of the project. does the city consider that in applying for some of these projects or thinking about where the funds are coming from for this work? Yeah, so um, overall, not just in uh, concerning water projects or sewer projects, just when you're looking at projects as a whole, um, the city at times has been uh, financially stressed. I'm sure that a lot of other municipalities can speak the same way. So you can sometimes get in the dangerous pattern of um, trying to only pick off the uh, smaller projects or just kind of playing, like I said, catch up or repair, putting band-aids on things, doing emergency fixes when stuff happens, as opposed to uh, planning ahead on the project. So the most important thing for that, I would say, is just having accurate and involved uh, capital planning, having a good five, 10-year capital improvement plan so that you can see the larger and the smaller projects and kind of retry to factor that into your uh, debt uh, payments and what, what loans you take out, as well as uh, for your budgeting. And if you set it up that way, five, 10 years out on some of these larger projects, that gives you enough time to, uh, you know, to go out and look at what different grant opportunities or uh, no, no interest loan opportunities are, are out there from state, federal, or nonprofits to help uh, move forward and address the larger projects.
administration of the Green Innovation Grant Program, are these grants made on a reimbursement basis? And is there any ability to provide upfront funding for grantees? I think it's really um, significant that the match percentage goes from a 10% match for the EJ communities versus the 25% uh, match. That was something that I wrote down uh, for other communities. But in thinking about um, you know, the, the reimbursement, upfront funding, how, how might that work for municipalities? Yeah, that's a great question and different grants work differently, uh, but we're a cost incurred program. So as soon as you were, if you were awarded, as soon as you incurred a cost, you would submit that cost to us. So let's say, for example, you incurred a cost for engineering services, um, you know, you got an invoice for 20,000, you would send us that invoice. Prior to you paying it, you would send it to us, assuming it's approved um, by, you know, your internal review, we would then review it make sure we have no issue with it. We would then pay, um, we would then reimburse, you know, the entity for you, uh, you know, up to that 90% or 75% based on the grant amount. Um, and then you would have, I believe it's uh, 45 days to show us that you paid the contractor or the, you know, the consultant at that point. So um, we do, while you do have to have the match available to pay, um, you know, we, you don't have to have any other cash outlay, you know, you don't have to take out a ban, you know, in order to pay out, you know, we're not going to only pay you when the project is complete, we pay you as you, um, as you incur the cost. Great, thank you. That's, that's really significant, especially I know a number of grants are reimbursement based and that can be really challenging and at the scale of some of these capital projects, it sounds like this is a really significant feature. Yeah, the other sort of nice feature about our funding is um, as long as there's no issues, you know, let's say we have concerns from MWBE and Joe had mentioned that before, you know, if there's concerns from that perspective, that can really delay the time frame. But typically, you know, you submit an invoice to us and depending on what day of the week you submit it to us, um, it could be um, reimbursed to you within a week at the best case scenario, or some, you know, maybe two weeks, depending on what day exactly you submit it. But we're uh, very quick to be able to turn around money. And we, you know, we do that in the form of a wire transfer directly to um, the applicant's bank account. So it, it's really pretty seamless. That's great. We have just a few minutes left. Any other questions? Give it. One moment. Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for our breakfast lecture this morning. A huge thank you to Brian and Joe for sharing your perspectives on green infrastructure and the Green Innovation Grant Program. Um, there's lots of projects that are GIGP funded across the state. You know, Brian mentioned several of those. So if you get a chance to take a look at, at some of those, there's lots of other case studies as well. But really, thanks to the city of Poughkeepsie for sharing the projects. You know, in process that are just wrapping up. Really excited to hear about the Liberty Street in particular as that's finished up. And um, we look forward to seeing you next month. Next month is December 8th, 8.30 to 9.30 in the morning. We'll be back with a couple of case studies on dam removal, both from the state agency permitting perspective and also from county government in thinking about the steps needed to, to go through and funding needed to uh, remove dams and restore streams. So thank you so much. And uh, we hope to see you next month. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.